You're listening to WCAT Radio, your home for authentic Catholic programming. We're back in the hot seat, my friends, here again on Polly Pat's Paradigm. Joined here in the new year, 2021, by my good friend Eric Robinson. And we just had a lot of fun talking about the consecration to St. Joseph we just did. And we're back for another impromptu uh, hot seat Q&A episode, whatever we call these things, where we just throw uh, throw questions and challenges each other's way and see whether we're competent or not. And uh, Wow, no pressure. <laughs> yeah, see whether these episodes get aired or not, right? <laughs> yes. Um, but yeah, always always a pleasure. I always enjoy these. They're They're fun. We never tell each other what we're bringing to the table. Yeah, uh, so it's 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 good. It's it's uh, it's uh, it's something I look forward to, and we I, we try to do these, but usually once a month, once every two months. So yes, always a joy, Eric. How are you? Good, good. Yeah, I, I you know I try to tie in at least one question that kind of has to do with philosophy. So maybe I'll maybe I'll do that this time. Maybe not. We don't know. I mean, I <laughs> yeah. I know what I'm going to ask, but you don't know. I've got a pretty narrow wheelhouse, so. Uh... That's right. I'll punt if I have to. You so, don't have uh, a narrow wheelhouse. You're a generalist. You're an expert <laughs> in everything, right? I've got a I've got a narrow generalism. Uh, <laughs> I guess you could say. Let's see. If you ask me about music or philosophy, uh, I'll probably be all right. If you, hmm, well, we'll, we'll, we'll see. Yeah, we'll we'll see. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I I always um, qualified that I am a studious amateur at best when it comes to theology. So wow. Yeah, yeah. So we, I, I, de- I defer the, the tougher theological questions to you. That's, uh, that's why, that's why you're my co-host, right? I also feel like you're good with politics, but yeah. Well, you know, political philosophy was really kind of one of the first things I was really interested in, just mm-hmm. as, as a teenager. Um, I guess we just, if people don't mind us chatting for a minute. Um, and uh, you know, so I kind of grew up with a lot of liberal leanings, and then. Um, I read a couple of books that got me interested in libertarianism specifically because they're like, oh, actually, this kind of sounds more like the way I think about things. Um, And then uh, I just kind of like went deep into that, into some of the more prominent libertarian thinkers in high school. And then, you know, interestingly, you know, with political philosophy, you kind of hit you kind of hit some boundaries, right, where it's like, how do I how do I justify this Uh, specifically ethical and moral Mm, constraints? And then you're, and then what you realize is that political philosophy just can't answer, um, it just can't answer everything, and you have to expand, and then you have to get into ethics and morality, and then ethics and morality can't, you know, that itself is um, kind of derived from, I would argue, a greater metaphysical project, and then you got to go to to metaphysics, and uh, and then you know that ultimately consumed me, and is where I, I spent most of the time. But it's funny, is because as I kind of like went deeper, and I considered ethics more, and then metaphysics, I kind of went re back, kind of went back through. I think with better starting points, and corrected and adjusted a lot of my political philosophy. Wow! Um, so what got you know in 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 many ways what got me interested in in philosophy. Um, my initial commitments were later changed as I got deeper into philosophy. So I would like in the next couple of years to to go further again uh, into political philosophy. Yeah, um, but in like the past five ten years, it's just been something I've been taking like frequent peeks into, okay. but not like serious sustained study like I have with metaphysics or ethics or anything like that. Mm-hmm. So this is not one of my hot seat questions, but now I'm curious, like. Do you still have libertarian leanings? Um, if you want to give me an easy one, we could make that one of the hot seat uh, questions. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. So you know, what is uh, what is uh, I, okay? This will be a hot seat question. For okay, you. what yep. is your political leaning? What is your political philosophy? Yeah. What yes. is your politics? I mean, that's a suit. I can't get this wrong, right? Because it's not even challenging. Um, or maybe we could tie it into like what made me abandon libertarianism or what, what are my critiques of libertarianism? Maybe something like that. Um, yeah. So I, I consider myself a common good conservative at this point, um, which is really, I think, the political perspective that comes out of a commitment to a sort of um, traditional natural law perspective, uh, a contemplation of, uh, of human nature what a human being is essentially as a, as a rational, social, political animal, what causes us to flourish, 
um, in an objective sense and that, and that there, that there is a sort of a, a, an objective flourishing, uh, that can be attained for the human person. So it's not just whatever you want, right? Like there are constraints on, on, um, on, uh, what we can do morally and ethically, uh, by our nature, by the type of thing that we are, uh, natures that are ultimately given to us just by God. Um, so yeah, libertarianism, uh, broadly considered is actually just like a kind of very far form of liberalism. And the idea of the liberal project in general is this commitment to, um, trying to organize a pluralistic society, a society with a lot of different beliefs, maybe even cultures, with some type of, of dispassionate organizing principle. And the idea is if we can find this dispassionate organizing principle, that can kind of be the glue that binds all these different beliefs uh, and, and values and whatever into a cohesive society that somehow gets along and manages itself. And mm-hmm. this, this is obviously a, a big secular project as well. And libertarianism, now I think that that's all fantasy, by the way, at this point. Like, I think that that's, that that's impossible, right? Because how could you ever be dispassionate between uh, party A that thinks abortion is murder and party B that thinks abortion is health care? Like, how could you ever be dispassionate about something right. like that, right? Like, you just can't be, right? Uh, and politics, at the end of the day, is just picking winners and losers and deciding what value systems are going to prevail and which are not. So I think the whole project from a get-go sounds nice, um, but if, as you think about it more substantially, it's it just doesn't make any sense and uh, <laughs> at all. Now, libertarianism tries to find that dispassionate principle in something like uh, what's called the non-aggression principle, right? That's mm-hmm. kind of what they're trying to do is saying whatever else should organize the society should be a principle around the idea of not initiating force or aggression against other parties, right? Um, and, you know, I was kind of attracted to that because I think in a general way, uh, uh, you know, so, some libertarian thinkers like Rothbard would say it's the non-aggression axiom. Now, I think that that's, false there's nothing axiomatic about you shouldn't aggress against somebody that's not like the law of non-contradiction right it's not self-evidently true denying it doesn't entail an absurdity it's eminently challengeable many people think that there are situations where aggression is is perfectly warranted for example if if uh person a is uh, abusing their children, we think that maybe a legitimate uh, means of intervention might be political authority to remove the children, to aggress against the parents, maybe even put that parent in jail. And so, like, so there's just a lot of instances where we think actually aggression might be merited. So what I've realized, you know, this is, is this non-aggression principle or commitment uh, by itself is not going to work. Um, and in order to make it work, we would have to qualify it so heavily that it almost becomes pointless. Right. Like, OK, we shouldn't aggress unless this or unless that or unless yeah. this other thing. Right. And it's like, well, in what sense is this even worth holding on to? Right. Maybe we need something a little bit more robust. So that was that was something I realized is that, you know, this sort of non-aggression. It's definitely not an axiom. Smarter lib- libertarian thinkers who realize that would call it maybe it's a presumption. Um, and I can go along with that to a certain extent. Um, I'm at a, at a point where I think aggression certainly is. Uh, in various forms, and it also depends how you define aggression. Because somebody be, might say, "Well, it's not aggression if somebody else is being aggressive," and then it's like, yeah. so you know, there's there's a lot of nuances here or there. But but at the end of the day, libertarianism, I think, tries to hold on to a radical individualism. It tries to put park uh, morality in a sort of uh, either a consent based ethics, right? Uh, and I think that that's a failure um, because whatever else whatever other use consent is to the moral project, it's something that floats atop um, deeper moral considerations, right? So I'll give you an example. Like, I, Eric, I can't consent for you to drive my neighbor's car because I don't have the, the power to, to give you that permission, <laughs> right? right? You'd be like, yeah. I'd be like, so you'd be like, you can't consent to that. And well, why couldn't I? Because, because there's deeper moral considerations, right? It's not my property. I don't have a power to just use my neighbor's car without trespassing or thievery, which he could have a, you know, a serious grievance with me. So like consent isn't just this magic wand that you can just wave and be like, Whoosh, I consent, therefore it's moral. No, <sighs> consent is clearly contingent upon deeper moral considerations. And, you know, where this is ignored is when it comes to... um whether we can consent to doing evil actions ourselves, 
right? Okay. So sometimes, so this is kind of what I'm getting at, right? Like if, if two people, like, could I consent to cut off my own arm just willy nilly? I would argue no, <laughs> right? <laughs> and that would, you know, or if you did it, it certainly wouldn't be a moral action. It would be an evil action unless there was some like overriding reason, like it was gangrenous and it was going to kill you if you didn't cut it off, right? But otherwise, you can't, uh, you can you never have, my position now in ethics is you never have a right to do a wrong and consent mm-hmm. can never override that. So to, to the extent that any liberal project, including libertarianism, wants to kind of just reduce morality to consent, I think that's fundamentally flawed. I think that's completely wrong. Yeah. And, and um, a lot of libertarianism uh, would entail that commitment. And to that extent, that's, that's one of the reasons I reject uh, libertarianism. Uh, so there's, there's deeper moral reasons. I don't think the non-aggression axiom is an axiom. I don't think it's an it's a effective organizing principle. I think it's eminently challengeable. Uh, I think their consent-based ethics is just flat out wrong. And I think just in a practical sense, um, a lot of it is very, especially unlike the farther forms of libertarianism, like anarcho-capitalism or um, uh, you know the anarcho-syndicalists and people like that. It's just it, like you're just it's just never going to happen, right? <laughs> like it's just it's you know it's just it's just so uh, you know uh, utopian thinking and like a really bad idea. So um, now people might say, well, all utopian thinking is bad. I would say no, it's not. Like some, some ideas are like utopian sounding, but they're still worth striving towards. Like I want to live in a society where we don't murder anybody. And that's kind of utopian because I don't know if we'll ever get there, but it's still worth striving towards other like utopian based ideas are just so uh, radically unrealistic and against human nature that they're not worth striving towards because it would just make everybody worse off. And I think certain forms of libertarianism as I tend towards the uh, anarchist side, um, mm. are like that. And a part of that is because we are social political animals. So any, you know, he- trying to veer towards anarchy is inherently against our nature. It's never going to, it's never going to be a thing. And if it ever were a thing, it would never be good for us anyways. So there's just kind of a smattering wow. of reasons of why I eventually abandoned libertarianism. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It seems like the whole consent thing has the presupposition that morality is subjective. Mm-hmm. Oh, if enough people agree that abortion's okay, then it is okay. Right. But returning to an objective ethics, an objective morality, mm-hmm. it's like, no, no matter how many people agree to this thing being a right or to this thing being okay, it does not make it okay. Right. Um, and not only that, like, but you know, abortion is really tough for libertarians because a lot of libertarians have pro-life leanings. So it's... Uh, and I always, you know, even before I was religious, always had strong pro-life leaning. So this was an, an issue for me uh, because a lot certain libertarians want to kind of just park everything in property rights mm. as well when it comes to legality, at least. So um, some in some in terms of morality, which I think is even dumber. Um, but for legality, hey, if it's your property, you can do whatever you want with it. So uh, you have libertarians that kind of take on this idea, this idiotic idea that. Uh, that the fetus is some type of trespasser or parasite, uh, which is, of course, biologically insane and and morally ridiculous. The fetus wow. is not a parasite; it's not a different species, right? It's your baby, and it's exactly where it's supposed to be, right? That's where right. babies are grown. Um, plus, plus a deeper consideration is again remember that 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 any rights we have to property are always instrumental. The only reason property has any value at all is because of what it attaches to, which is that thing of intrinsic value, which is a human being. So any type of system that wants to try and use something of instrumental value to undermine that, which is of intrinsic value, which is human life, is always, is always backwards, is always going yes. to support itself. Yes. And libertarianism falls prey to that, especially when it comes to life issues. Yes. Mm-hmm. Well, that's yeah. great. I, I, actually, some of the questions I do have for you today – also have to do with politics, but I'll let you ask me a question. Yes, yeah, sir. And, so uh, I told you uh, I found um, – I don't see this often, but every once in a while – first, let me say, I have a lot of very great, very smart, very articulate, very nuanced, very sophisticated Protestant friends. And you know who you are and you know I love you. But every once in a while, I come across a, a very special type of – fundamentalist protestant who's got a uh, who's got <laughs> who's got all the uh who's got all the cliche anti-catholic tropes and uh, i stumbled across one on my facebook feed the other day and when i when i did i'm like 
this is this is for Eric. This is totally for Eric. So I screenshotted it. I won't do the name. We'll keep it anonymous. But I'll read the post, and it's not so much a question, Eric. Is 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 it's if you were to respond to this, what would you say? Type of okay. thing. How, how does that sound? Okay. So the the original post was this. There was a, there was a main main post, and he had a comment underneath, and I'll I'll read both. The first one is. The Catholic Church has done more damage to the gospel of Jesus Christ than any other denomination or Pharisee or Sadducee. So that's the first one. And then he says, for example, this includes changing the Sabbath, creating new holidays, putting men in the position of God, creating idols to worship, exalting Mary above Christ, and so much more. Is he right about this, Eric? Do we need to, do we need to abandon and condemn the Catholic Church? No, no, we don't, because he is wrong on every account. <laughs> every single um, point. <laughs> we wouldn't even know what the gospel is apart from the Catholic Church. St. Augustine even said, apart from the Catholic Church, I would not even believe the gospels, because the gospels, the writings that we have, are contingent upon the authority of the Catholic Church confirming those as apostolic, as actual legitimate writings. And, and so, has the Catholic Church distorted the gospel? Well, think about this. In Galatians, it talks about, St. Paul says, even if an angel were to come to you with a different message than I have given to you, Galatians, of the gospel, then don't listen to that angel. Let him be anathema. Let him be accursed. If someone comes to you preaching a different gospel than the one that I gave you, let him be accursed. The question then is, well, what is the gospel Paul was giving to the Galatians? And how has that gospel been passed on uh, from generation to, gen- to generation is through the apostles' successors, the bishops, and their successors, and their successors, and their successors. And then when we come across heretics, like the heretic Arius, well, he was starting to preach a different gospel. Well, let him be anathema then. And there was a council that determined, the Council of Nicaea, this person is preaching a different gospel. He's saying Jesus actually isn't really God from God, true God from true God, light from light where we get some of the verbiage from the Nicene Creed that is coming as an attack against Arian, Arianism. Well, fast forward to 1517, let's say, just to put a number out there, where Martin Luther starts preaching a different gospel, sola fide. It's only by faith. It's only by faith. Uh, sola scriptura. You only need the scriptures. Um, and And such things like that. And it's like, well, is that actually the gospel and we look back and we see how the gospel has actually been transferred from generation to generation it's like no it's a little off it's a little off in this way it's not just faith alone it's faith and works as james says um it's you know faith needs to be producing works you know works perfect faith and these sorts of things um, Sola Scriptura, well, the Bible doesn't even claim that, and, and it really is nonsensical. And so he's claiming to preach a gospel that is this sort of imputed righteousness, this that God, you're still just a muck of sin, but God just covers you up and kind of ignores the rest, versus like what the Scriptures and the Fathers have professed is that, no, God does want to make you holy. And he does it through the grace of Jesus Christ coming to us through the sacraments. We see um, the sacrament, let's say, of the Eucharist was always seen to be the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ. Okay, Luther did hold on to a form of that, but he didn't hold on to the Catholic way of understanding that. Okay, so we can give Luther maybe some credit there. But then Calvin and Zwingli and these others all changed the view about the Eucharist. Maybe it's just a spiritual presence. Or Zwingli. Maybe it doesn't mean anything. It's just to get us to think back about Jesus' sacrifice. and doesn't actually do anything or mean anything. That is a change in the gospel of Jesus Christ. So, should we listen to those false prophets? No. We should listen to the Catholic Church, where the gospel has been preserved generation after generation. As far as moving the Sabbath, and I would like for you to read some of those things again. Well, I remember the first one you said, like, changing the Sabbath. Okay, yes, the Jewish Sabbath was on Saturday. But now in the Christian Sabbath, it's moved to Sunday. Why? It's because Jesus rose again on Sunday. And the earliest documentation we have from Christians, um, I believe the Didache 
First century document talks about it being moved to Sunday. St. Justin Martyr, for sure, um, in, in around 150 AD, says it's moved to Sunday because of the Lord raising from the dead on Sunday. So they're explaining how, yes, we're celebrating on Sunday. It's the Lord's Day. And even the Bible itself um, attests to the Lord's Day in the New Testament. I believe in the book of Revelation referring to the Lord's Day as Sunday. And so we have all this. So basically, if the Catholic Church is wrong about, quote unquote, changing the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday, and that's a reason to be against the Catholic Church, then you'd have to throw out the testimony of the first century Christians, the second century Christians, and every Christian that's come after that. Uh, and so, yeah, that was are you willing to do that? Strange, that was definitely a strange one. I mean, this the whole post is strange, but sometimes it's fun. Um, to, yeah, and the Mary being that, exalted yeah. over Christ, absolutely not. The catechism of the Catholic Church is very clear. We worship God and God alone. Mm-hmm. The adoration and worship that we give to the Father, to Jesus, to the Holy Spirit is altogether different than any sort of honor we give to a creature like Mary. Mary is definitely exalted in everything that we say and honor about Mary is given so that we can protect and better honor and better worship Jesus. And so Mary, yes, is highly honored, highly exalted, but it's because why, by, by us exalting her as the mother of God, that testifies to Jesus being God. Right. Mary is, uh, is an instrument of God's grace, testifies to the source of grace, Jesus Christ. And so Mary is not uh, worshipped. She's not an idol. She is exalted as the mother of God because she is. And um, that is an exalted role for sure, but that doesn't mean we worship her. We worship God and God alone. Yeah. And then what were some of the other ones real quick? Yeah, let me, uh, sorry, I have it screenshotted on, on my phone. And um, let me be clear. Like, First off, I'm not straw manning because I'm reading the post directly, but I also don't want to make it seem like this is representative of, of most Protestants. It isn't. No, most but of my are... Protestant friends that I have or much would, would, would e- think all this stuff is equally right. ridiculous. Of but I have like come across people that have stated these things. And it's important to talk about because – you know, I used to think certain ways like this. Like, I'm not... Right. I mean, the Mary thing is definitely common, but what strikes me about that is just the utter lack of curiosity, yeah. right? Because, like, all you need to do is open the Catholic catechism to see that that's wrong. Right. right? That's not yeah. some big research project, right? This is this is something that you could take. But people Like, maybe don't, you don't... Yeah, yeah. maybe yeah, maybe, maybe you don't like the 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 you know the the sort of um, reverence that Catholics show to Mary, but to say that they exalt Mary above Christ is just patently ridiculous, right? Yeah. Um, okay. The, the other ones were putting men in the position of God and creating idols to worship. Yeah. So I think I covered the idol thing. Like we definitely don't do that. Um, it does say don't make a graven image, um, but what does that mean? Because uh, immediately after an Exodus. Jesus or God uh, commands the Israelites to make carved images of angels and put them in the Holy of Holies. <laughs> okay. So I think what he really means there and what has always been thought to mean is that you should make no idol. Um, so, which means that you don't, so if you had a statue and you worship the actual piece of wood, the statue and thought it was God, that would be a problem. But if you create a statue of a saint, let's say, and you are kneeling before the statue and asking the saint to pray for you, you're not asking, you're not thinking that this piece of wood has any animation about it. You think that this represents, this is an icon of a saint. And when we honor the icon, we honor the saint. And that the saint will hear our prayers. And once again, we're not worshiping the saints. We are honoring them, which is a big difference. And by virtue of the incarnation, God becoming man dwelling among us, the image of the invisible God, Jesus Christ, We now can have images of the only begotten son of God because he imaged himself. He did that. So he became in the flesh. So if you just happened to live back then, 2000 years ago, and you were, had your iPhone, let's say, or a phone, and you could snap a picture of Jesus, you could do that because he was walking among us. And, um, and that's not idolatrous to do that, to claim that God became man and dwelt among us would, you know, to say that the statues of the Catholic Church are idolatrous would be equivalent to saying Jesus taking on human flesh is idolatrous, which is absurd. Um, and then the other one was, yeah, that men are in the position of God. Well, no, first of all, like uh, God is in the position of God, but God can appoint men to be his representatives, which he has done through all of Scripture. 
He appointed Moses to represent him to the Israelites. Was that wrong of God to do that? No, he can do it. And, and so, and it's a test for us. If we respect Moses, it shows our respect to God. Um, Jesus appointed Peter as the rock, which he would build his church on, gave him and him alone the keys of the kingdom of heaven and appointed the other apostles to be carry out his mission. And he said to them, whoever rejects you rejects me. So when we reject these men who represent God to us and who are supposed to carry on the mission of God, when we reject their authority, we're rejecting God himself. And so it's not that they take away from God's glory. In fact, it's quite the opposite. By them having and carrying the authority um, that Jesus himself gave to them, it exalts God's glory. Jesus alone is king, but he shares his reign to those who endure to the end. And so that magnifies his glory, the glory of God. Yeah. Good. Good stuff. Well, I'm satisfied with that. Thanks. Sure. All right. Um, I'll, I'll keep on the political one real, real quick, because this is an interesting question that I kind of have here. So in 2015, gay marriage was legalized in the United States of America. It seems that it's a done deal, right? Like the battle is kind of over as far as like, you don't hear many petitions of like, we should reverse this or we should make it illegal. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, 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 I have like multiple thoughts about what I'm about to ask, but basically like number uh, fundamental questions. Well, why should societies promote marriage between one man and one woman? And secondly, like, is it worth fighting for anymore in America as far as like fighting for this to become illegal or what should we be fighting for in now that we know that this is legalized, but we still value marriage as an institution from God. And like, how does that work? So, right. Yeah. Some yeah. thoughts there. Yeah. Good one. Uh, a searching one, uh, one that has, I guess, many potential layers to explore. Um, the, fir- the first one, and we've covered this in previous episodes, so I, I won't repeat too much right here and now um, is that, is just the, the general topic of sexual ethics, right? This is a sexual act. Is it susceptible to a moral analysis, right? Is, is, there, is, the, is there something about the sexual act that can be done in a way that could contribute to our human flourishing? And is there something about the sexual act that could uh, point us away that could frustrate human flourishing. And uh, I, I say yes, right? I didn't always think this way. I think this way now, right? And part of that comes with an essentialist worldview, right? That uh, that there is a such thing as human nature. Again, it puts moral constraints on us. There are certain things that we can do objectively to grow uh, in in excellence and perfection and flourishing, right? And there are certain things objectively that will tilt us away from or impede our human flourishing that can cause us to, to fail to reach our proper and ultimate end, right? So that's, that's sort of the underlying ethical basis. And as I've argued many times in writing on various podcasts, I don't think you can have a moral project without a commitment to essentialism and traditional natural law. And once you have that commitment, you're going to get a pretty traditional sexual morality out of that, right? Um, and so I've, I've written on this, this before that there's kind of a dilemma there, right? If you want, if you want to affirm a binding moral structure to the world, that some things are really right, uh, other things are, are really wrong and that our moral intuitions are at least generally aiming towards something that, that is, uh, that is real, uh, in a sense, um, uh, maybe they're not infallible, but they're generally reliable. We're going to need to ground that in human nature and we're going to need both essentialism and teleology, uh, but that comes with a, a a price, right? And that is that that our lives are shot through with moral considerations, uh, and, and it's not just linked to our sexual acts, but how we speak, how we treat other people, um, you know, uh, because you know what we do, uh, even on a very uh, minor level, is kind of etching out who we are, right? Um, so my 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 argument, my general argument, um, is that if you want if you want to hold on to morality, which I think all of us do, uh, there are going to be metaphysical commitments that can that can allow you to do that. 
but it's going they're going to be they're going to be ethical cons- implications from that 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 most people would consider very traditional and very very religious very christian i would argue and when that applies to the sexual act it's that the sexual act uh has a proper functioning it has a proper end a proper aim towards both uh union and procreation as the catholic church teaches right but i would argue you can you can just figure this out philosophically through a traditional natural law analysis and that uh, to ever in- intentionally pervert a faculty, to in- intentionally uh, frustrate um, a sort of natural power from attaining its natural end, and that itself is a is an analysis that would merit uh, its own episode. But just we'll just just kind of float it out there for now. Um, is is as a matter of metaphysical necessity, it's always going to be bad for you. It's always going to be wrong, right? Um, so that would include you know using your sexual powers. Um, uh, and it's not, it's, it's not just, you know, in sort of, uh, the same sex, uh, liaisons or encounters as well, but there's, there's, uh, there's other instances, um, even, you know, um, self acts that we would say would always be bad for you, um, as well. Um, certain, uh, overuse or addictions or obsessions, right. Um, that would be bad for you as well. So the reason I'm, I'm, I'm trying to generalize this is not to get around the question, but to see that when it comes to the, to the same, to the analysis of the same sex act as sort of veering off course in terms of, um, traditional natural law, it's not exclusive to that, right? That gets a lot of attention because it's, uh, it's, it's culturally very relevant right now. But it's like one, like one chapter in a very large book, right? And that's just – that's very important to understand because a lot of times people say, well, Christians, and Catholics, and traditional natural law theorists, like you're just obsessed with sex. No, we're not. The culture is obsessed with sex, right? <laughs> and it just so happens that you guys are always bringing it up and always challenging it, so we're responding to it, right? But we could run this analysis on on any other sorts of sinful, uh, you know, sinful acts. Um, so I just want to get that out there. So yeah, you know, the 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 same sex act is always going to be bad for you. It's always going to be bad for you because we're intentionally, uh, you know, um, impeding a natural power from reaching its natural end. And that we are teleologically ordered uh, to uh, for the sexual act towards both union and procreation. And once we see that, we can see that the, the whole procreative element of that, and part of the reason it's bound up with the unitive element, is that uh, we're not you know we're not only ordered usually to have one kid but many kids. And kids need rearing; they need development, and it takes a lot of time to do that. And after one kid, usually comes another kid. So, like once, in order to kind of fulfill that whole project, it takes a lot of time, <laughs> right? So we can see how we're just from a pure kind of philosophical analysis, something like a traditional monogamous marriage starts to arise out of that. So just even putting aside divine revelation. Uh, which obviously affirms that we can see how something like a very traditional marriage just comes out of a, a sort of philosophical anthropology and ethical considerations of of, uh, of human sexual activity, right? Um, when it, so once that's understood, that that's like what marriage is, um, the first thing to note is that, you know, same-sex marriage is just a redefinition of a term, Um and same thing with like saying that uh, two two guys have sex. That's not that's not right, <laughs> right? Like it, it, it's not. Um, you know, sex uh, again. The the proper ordering of sex is something that um, you know, in its natural normal course, something uh, you know, a procreative and sort of comprehensive unity is at least possible. Right now, there might be some type of genetic or medical reason why procreation can't happen, but in its normal natural course, it's at least possible. That's never possible with two guys, right? It just it just isn't. Um, so whatever two guys do, you know, it's not sex. It's maybe mutual masturbation or whatever you want to call it. Not to get too graphic with the language, but I think precision is really important because a lot of times, you know, the the wool is pulled over our, our eyes politically by redefinitions and manipulations of language. And once you realize that, you know, um, that it makes no sense of like two guys to, to, to have sex, um, it, it also doesn't make sense to say that two guys could ever be married, right? 
Um, and this is why I think it's important for us to, to understand that whatever, whatever else we want to call it, it's not a marriage as properly and traditionally understood. It's something else, right? So like same-sex marriage, we would argue, is just it's a contradiction in terms. It's like a square circle. Like what you're talking about really doesn't even make sense. So there's, there's just like a, a fundamental conceptual um, impossibility that uh, an absurdity that people have just gone along with when I, so like we're arguing it like way down on the practical level, but I, I would argue we have to bring it back up and say like, what you're talking about isn't actually, isn't even a thing first off, right? It's just, it's just not a thing. We've just manipulated language, mm. right? Uh, and we see this, we see this all the time. I, I mean, we talk about like abortion being healthcare. <laughs> it's a joke, right? It's a complete joke, right? Killing somebody can never be healthcare, right? Ever. Ever. Right. Um, so, you know, if you want to, uh, you know, try and, and see through the fog of politics, just always be very um, – ask for definitions and always try to be um, uh, cautious of when terms might be getting redefined, right? Because that is one of, the, one of the most cliche and overused and very effective political strategies that, has, that, that is being used right now. We're seeing man and woman trying to be redefined with the whole gender ideology, which I would argue is just sort of a, an expected extension of, of the same-sex stuff that has come before it. Okay, so those are just some conceptual things. Um, practically, again, it comes from human nature, right? Human nature – ordered towards the rearing of children, children have a right to be reared by a mother and a father, right? They have rights claims on. And this is why in civilized societies, we punish deadbeat dads who get women pregnant and then try, and we should, we should punish that, right? We should, we should provide strong disincentives for fathers that want to engage in the sexual act without a proper understanding of what, uh, of what the, the moral implications are of that, which is unitive and procreative, right? And everybody agrees with that. Everybody agrees that if dad tries to, to, to abandon the scene, we should punish dad. And I'm fully on board with that, right? Um, because children have a right claim on their father for the father's love, attention, care, education, moral development. So anything less than that, I would argue, is an abuse to children. It is child abuse, and this is true not just in terms of the of the traditional natural law perspective of, of what children are owed. A lot of people think about the adults, but we forget about what children exactly. are owed. Yep. Children are owed this. They're owed a mom and dad, right? Um, a mom and dad, a biological mom and dad who stay together through a, a comprehensive lifelong union, right? That's what mm -hmm. children are owed, and that's why divorce itself, divorce is a form of child abuse, I would argue. Uh, I'm a product of divorce. I can tell you it's, it's very traumatic. Um, and, it, it, you know, not just considering it from the ethical perspective, but the empirical perspective. We know the damage that has been done to children through broken families. I mean, we know that nothing uh, better prepares you for a healthier, more successful life than having mom and dad together, right? And a strong family traditional family household. So we not only have the philosophical analysis, we have the empirical support. We know what happens uh, with broken homes. It's terrible for the children. It's terrible for long-term outcomes. This couldn't be more obvious from many, many different perspectives. So we have now, I guess, is getting to your second point. Uh, so that means, so what does that mean? It means we should incentivize traditional family units, right? Because if we want healthy societies, we need healthy new generations to lead those societies, yes. right? We need healthy formation. So society um, at large is dependent on that first society, which is the family unit, right? So we have uh, every reason for society at large, our, our nation, our country, to provide the strongest incentives it can for healthy traditional family units, right? Because we need healthy traditional family units for a healthy country overall. And we can't expect a healthy country overall unless we have healthy. So it's a symbiotic relationship uh, is, is what I would argue. So that means we should have strong incentives for, uh, for families to stay together and to have lots of children, I would argue. And we see countries that do this. Uh, strong incentives for having children. Uh, we should have strong disincentives for divorce. We should get rid of ridiculous laws like no fault divorce and stuff like that. Uh, and yeah, we should recognize that same, not only just, I think, push back against the legality of same-sex marriage, but just um, 
also it's it's conceptual absurdity like go even deeper like this isn't even even a thing now if we want to discuss civil like privileges for civil unions in general of like uh a brother and a sister taking care of an older older parent. That's a separate de- you know, that's a separate debate, uh, or just people living together for certain legal privileges, and that's kind of context dependent on what those legal privileges would be in the society as a whole. But regardless of all of that, um, I think every society needs to take a vested interest for itself and for so- society at large as creating special privileges and special incentives for the traditional family unit. And of course, none of this can be isolated. Like we, we have to consider all the wider factors: how kids are educated, their moral upbringing in the education system, how sexual ethics is taught or not taught, uh, you know, in in public education. So there's so many, so much interconnectedness here that it's it's hard to kind of just pinpoint one thing. But at least this much, at least this much. And then in terms of it being a done deal, it's not a done deal. We've seen many other countries that have pushed back against. Uh, many of these progressive secular agendas and done very well with that. Unfortunately, it's often after a time that they've gone through immense the immense pain that uh, far left wing ideology brings, um, and they kind of have to learn the hard way. Um, but you know, it's this idea of the Overton window, and I think this is a difference between conservatives and and progressives in our country. Is that conservatives are always willing to push the Overton window. They're, you know, of what of what's allowed an acceptable conversation, right? So they'll always go out on a limb and say something that everyone thinks is crazy, like um, women uh, can have a biological penis or something ridiculous like that, and and the right which you hear now, and like the first time people hear it, they're like, "That's crazy. We don't have to worry about that because it's so crazy." But then they keep doing it, and they keep doing it, and they keep doing it, and the Overton window eventually shifts, right? And we're seeing, and we we saw it with. Uh, with uh, same-sex, you know, marriage, and now we're seeing it with LBGTQ ideology, and conservatives just assume that because something is so crazy, it will never gain traction. That's historically completely wrong, right? Um, these things do gain traction, and the problem is progressives are willing to always push the Overton window. Conservatives are not only not willing to push back, but but they're certainly seem unwilling to to. Um, let me rephrase that: they're not. Uh, only seem unwilling to prevent the Overton window from shifting, but they seem especially unwilling to want to push it back in what I would argue is the proper direction. Mm-hmm. And that's to your point is like a lot of, you know, quote unquote conservatives, mainstream Republicans, like they don't even talk about traditional marriage. Right. They just think they just think it's a done deal. And that's why I think these people are losers. Um, you're not a you're not a conservative. You're just not like. Yeah. We, Whatever you are, like you don't have a proper moral and ethical formation because if you did, you'd realize, no, these are fundamental issues and we need to push the conversation back in the other direction. Um, and a lot of it is just because they're cowards. Uh, one is they don't know why they hold the positions they do, so they're just yeah. ignorant. And the other is they just they just give in to the bully tactics and intimidation tactics of people who would just call them bigots or whatever. Um uh, uh, you know, because they oppose these types of social policies. There's nothing bigoted about it. Um, it just, it just yeah. is what it is. Um, so, my answer is yes. We should, we should be fighting these cultural battles because it's, it's, yes. it's everything. Um, and you know, I'm, I guess I'm a little bit more optimistic because um, I think what we're seeing now with all the political upheaval is, <sighs> yeah, I guess I could go either way. I mean. A lot of people with the LGBTQ stuff. It's a shame that it like it took it getting into sports until people got really upset. If you know what I mean, right? With like men oh, dominating like, yes. women in sports, like that. That to me is like like fairness in sports is the least of my concern. Like, okay, that's a little annoying, but how about we stop pretending that men can be women in the first place, right? right. Like, like, why did why did it take until it got into like you know somebody beating up your daughter in a wrestling match who's a dude? Why, like, like maybe that's just like the most obvious manifestation in your life of this absurdity, but like we should have a problem. Not there, but at the at the first instance when somebody is so confused that they think a man could ever be a woman, right? That, that's the fundamental issue. So it's not it's not about fairness in sports. It's about truth. Right. It's about truth. So like I'm seeing like more conservatives make arguments of like we shouldn't allow transgenders in sports. And like fine, at least they're fighting some battles. But to me, it just seems like you're already so far down the field at this point. Like we should have been fighting the battle way way back at the opposite at the opposite end. 
So I don't even know if I answered your questions there. No, <laughs> you did. Long enough. Yeah. And it reminds me of what we talked about in our gospel of John series of, you know, the light came, but men love darkness instead. Right. And they rejected the truth, you know? And, um, uh, one minor, minor follow-up question. I'm just curious because maybe this is a question on other people's minds. But okay, so let's say you have um, two lesbian women that are "quote unquote" married uh, legally in the United States, and you have a child that's in a really terrible orphanage, and no one's adopting this child. They can either stay at this terrible orphanage, or this same-sex couple. They really had wanted a, a daughter. And they, they want to adopt. Right. Should the government say, no, you can't because you're a same sex couple or yes, you can. And I'm sorry, this is, it's just like, yeah, a no, I understand. No, I understand like, your question. Yeah. So let me, let me put it this way. Right. Like you have a, a child that's already in a terrible situation. Right. Right. And uh, you have this sort of same sex couple that wants to adopt it. And they seem like they'll, they'll take much better care of the child. Right. That's, that's essentially it. So wouldn't it be better and in a sense, I want to say yes. So I want to say a couple things to this. Number one is we don't use exceptions to form rules, right? We don't base policy on exception cases, right? Um, and Catholics and natural law theorists, we have the equipment for a moral reasoning to handle things like this called the doctrine of double effect. Like, okay, we can, we can take this option because given the situations – uh, we're trying to prevent the greater evil, even if there's foreseen negative consequences, but we're not intending those foreseen negative consequences, right? right. So we can, we can handle situations like this, but we don't base the rules off of these exceptions, right? And same thing is, is when it comes to like the, the – like, it, I, 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 it's difficult to have these because it's hard to like – give the examples without getting kind of crude, if you know what I mean, but right. I, guess we'll, I guess we'll just do it, right? So, like, let's say that there's a child in the woods, Eric, and, mm. and we're there, and there's no, there's no mother around, but wouldn't it be better if, like, we took care of the ch- children ourselves, like, two guys just took care of the children? And the answer is yes, but then the question is, like, why would sodomy have to be brought into that? Right. 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 So you see what I'm getting at, right? Yeah. The, the, and, and bringing up a child, um, you know, of, you know of, of two women wanting to virtuously take care of a child in and of itself doesn't seem like a bad thing, especially if there's no other option, right? And if the child is being previously abused. Um, but why do perverted sexual acts have to be brought into it? Yeah. Right? That, and that's what people are overlooking, right? Because then you are instilling something into the child that is itself abusive, that's tilting the child away. Now, you might just have abusive situation A and abusive situation B and doctrine of double effect kicks in and you just say, I'm going to go with the situation, um, not because I want the abuse that's attached with it, but I'm trying to prevent the greater evil. And that would be a morally acceptable choice because you would be delighted if the abusive situation in, in situation A wasn't there. Like you'd be like, yes. you're not aiming for that, right? right. Uh, it'd be better if it wasn't there, but just given the constraints of the circumstances, you can still make a morally permissible choice. Mm-hmm. Um, so we can handle these kind of thought experiments, but uh, the point is, why does perverse sexual, why would perverse sexual activity need to be brought into that? What would that, what would that, what would that add? I would say it wouldn't add anything. It would be, it would be uh, detrimental to the child first off. Mm-hmm. Um and two is we just don't use exceptions to form general policies. Or rules. Right. So we can handle exceptions as they come up, but we don't base policies off of exceptions. Mm-hmm. All right. Very good. Does that, does that answer your question? Yes. Okay. Tough, I mean, it's a tough one. People don't like talking about this stuff, but I mean, it's the conversations that, that you need to, you need to have. Yeah. Uh-huh. And especially trying to do it without getting into the, the gory details. Exactly. Exactly. Right. Mm-hmm. Maybe one more question each or. Yeah, let's do it. Um, so let me. Um, let me think back on um, on a, on a. If you actually, do you have, have one more two, off the top of your head? Yeah, I have two questions. All right, yeah, throw one more out there because I gotta I gotta think more. Sorry, I didn't prepare before. No, this, no. But, um, yeah. Okay, so the second question, I'm the third question, um, has has to do with philosophy. Um, but I'm not going to do that because the other question I had also has to do with politics. And since you're already on the roll, might as well just throw me, throw me under the, just throw me under the, uh, what is socialism? Why is it bad? 
parentheses, why I'm asking this question is because it seems like a lot of people are concerned that America is becoming socialist. Right. And that socialism seems to be spreading from now China to the ends of the earth. And people are very concerned. And some people are like, yay. And other people are like, nay. And so just want to. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So this is, yeah, this is a, this is a big one. Right. Um, and again, uh, definitions, redefinitions, right? So sometimes what's called socialism isn't socialism, right? So let's, let's get clear here. Is that like having social programs, having welfare states, that's not, that's not socialism properly understood. And that's like what a lot of, you know, American mainstream Republicans need to understand, you know, as a common good conservative, as a Catholic, we can be, and I would argue often should be in favor of various and, and any number of social programs and social welfare, right? Socialism, you know, as, as it comes uh, out of Marxism is grounded in a number of philosophical commitments that are fundamentally ab- absurd and opposed to human flourishing and human nature, which is why the Catholic Church was able to condemn socialism before socialism wrought immense havoc on the planet. Right. So we have we have, you know, pronouncements from the Catholic Church, various popes condemning socialism before it racked up, uh, you know, its enormous body count. Now, why is that? Because on a moral analysis, it's a failure. And for a couple of reasons, one is that, you know, there's certain commitments of, of Karl Marx and his philosophy that uh, that. Uh, that you know, uh, kind of undergird his socialism. So it might be worth just kind of um, yeah exploring uh, a you know a number a number of these right. So so first off, socialism and communism are um, it's important for people to understand that they're really just uh, they're on the same. It's really a matter of of achievement is the difference. Two sides right? of the same coin. Not even necessarily that. They're just different um, stages of development. Different stages of development is exactly that, right? So the idea for for Marx is he was he was fundamentally an anarchist, right? So the idea is that we would eventually get to some, you know, egalitarian society where we could abolish the state, right? Where we wouldn't we wouldn't even need the need the state at any point. And, and but socialism was kind of how we got there. And so traditionally understood, socialism is really just the abolition of private property. That's that's what we're talking about when it comes to socialism. I, I, I hesitate to simplify it too much, but the idea is government ownership of the means of production, private property, right? Uh, and trying to get us uh, to a society uh, based on certain egalitarian commitments, where eventually the state would just would just dissolve, right? Uh, where we wouldn't have um, any of these uh, sort of um, different class structures right so so for for traditionally marx um you know he's he's he he wants to kind of reduce everything to to economics so let's go through his various commitments one thing is he's a dialectic materialist right as his metaphysical commitments which is like essentially taking the worst of of hegel and the worst of feuerbach and mixing them together so he's an atheist (laughs) strike number one right so no no transcendent anything right and he's a materialist strike number two And he's a dialectic materialist, so he kind of thinks that in a very odd, incoherent, uh, and inexplicable way, the material universe is sort of just kind of like working itself out in this progressive development. So he kind of takes like this commitment that was previously seen in in idealism and kind of like puts it into materialism. And and all I can say is it's, it's not just utterly incoherent and very strange, but even most Marxists don't commit themselves to this metaphysical premise anymore because it's just it's just so it's just so untenable uh but it's important to understand the history of it because you know um metaphysics uh and especially bad metaphysics has consequences right so we're Mm -hmm. kind of we're kind of living with these consequences uh marx is also an economic um reductionist and determinist right so he thinks that everything can kind of be explained by economic class struggles like everything can be explained by economic class struggles, religion, various cultures, societies, you name it. Uh, and that itself is ridiculous, right? I mean, it's just, it's obvious. It's certain uh, aspects of, of history and, and human society uh, have arose from considerations independent of, uh, of just economic class struggles. Uh, I mean, some of the most major historical instances uh, have arisen independent. I mean, of course, religion, Christianity, Judaism themselves, right, do, certainly do not re- reduce to economic class struggles, no matter how much the revisionist historian tries to say 
otherwise, right? So you have uh, dialectic materialism, economic reductionism, uh, and uh, of course, a fundamental denial of human nature uh, and uh, traditional natural law, the, you know, the, the, the sort of the moral dimension of the human person, um, which leads to a sort of grotesque utilitarianism uh, within socialism, right? Hmm. That uh, we're kind of looking at the collective uh, and then based on what our goals for the collective are, uh, we can we, – we have a sort of ends justify the means mentality that happens uh, with socialism, right? So we can, um, we can use government force uh, to organize society however we want, uh, uh, and this has been done in an exceedingly number of, of vicious, inhumane, and diabolical and, and genocidal ways uh, throughout, throughout the history of socialism. Uh, the, the body count is unfathomable which is always strikes me. And it's like still going on now. It's like you see people yeah. eating flamingos in Venezuela because they have nothing else to eat and people still adv- advocate for socialism. Like how high does the body count need to get on a practical level, let alone uh, the absurd philosophy that socialism extends from. So socialism is wrong because it's got it, you know, where it comes from. Its foundation is wrong metaphysically. Uh, it's got its philosophical anthropology wrong. It's got its history wrong, uh, and it's got its morality wrong. So it strikes out on every single level. <laughs> wow. Every, and if that is enough, it's been tested. It's been tested, right? So, so it that fails what blows my mind, st- Pat, is that it has been tested, and like it failed in Russia or Soviet Union. It's failed in everywhere it's been, and so why do people still push it and promote it? And like, why is it still spreading if it's already failed? Yeah, I mean that's that's a that is a, a great question and probably n- not one that I'm as qualified uh, to answer. But I mean, there's certain aspects of it that you know superficially are pretty easy to sell. Um, it appeals to to kind of the baser aspects of human nature, right? It appeals to uh, tribalistic impulses, certainly uh, of wanting to, uh, and you see it now, right? So a whole bunch of this sort of um, uh, the the whole uh, what what we have now with the sort of race warfare that's going on in America is the same thing. It's the same Marxist ideology. It's the same pig with a different lipstick, right? The reason you're oppressed, the reason your life is the way it is, is because of white people, right? Um, not necessarily rich people or a certain economic class now, but now it's a racial thing, right? Um, and this is this is how it how it takes hold and grips people's brains. And the scary thing is, is people don't recognize that this is what's happening. It's mm-hmm. the same ideology, just a different context, right? These the reason your life isn't everything you want it to be, or the reason that it's bad, and the reason it's terrible, is because of this, uh, because of people of a certain skin color, or people of a certain economic position, and you know. The sad thing is when it comes to constructing these narratives is you can find enough, um, you know, instances that make it seem plausible. It's like you can find enough rich people have done terrible, oppressive things. You can find enough white people that have done terrible, oppressive things, right, to paint, a, to paint a story, even though it's completely ridiculous, hateful, false, immoral, uh, and, and ravages people's rationality. Um, but I mean, that's that's what's going on, right? So the ideology, critical theory, what people need to understand, and is really an extension of Marxist theory. And critical mm-hmm. theory is what's kind of behind so much of this sort of uh, intersectionality, race um, warfare that's going on. Um, so the deeper psychology of it is something that we could spend a lot of time talking about, discussing. Um, but it's not i don't think it's i don't think it's um it's not that hard to imagine why people buy into this yeah but we can see we can see how it has uh how it would have appealed to certain people how it could alleviate people of of things that they don't necessarily want to do or own up to like nobody wants to think that uh um maybe maybe the reason i'm not in a great spot is because of some of the decisions i've made nobody likes to think about that now look, wow. granted, 
some people are in bad positions through no fault of their own. I certainly, right? And that's why Christians are called to a life of justice and charity. Some people just have it bad because of where they were born, because of the failure of their parents or society at large, because of persecution. Nobody's denying that. But other people have just made it's it's other people it's a mix. Some upbringing, some bad choices. Other people had great upbringing and they made really bad choices, right? The point is, and when we search our hearts, we all know this, it's never easy. It's always easier and always more tempting that whatever befalls us to want to to wanna find somebody to escape, to point the finger at, right? Um, and we could see how any ideology that could help a person rationalize away um, the things they want to rationalize away, um, why that might be, why that might be appealing as pernicious as it is. Um, so those are just some, yeah, initial initial thoughts. Uh, wow. But yeah, yeah, Marxism is, is first. Of all, it's it's a deep philosophy. It goes, you know, to really understand socialism, you got to try and understand Marxism. To understand Marxism, you got to try and understand where he's drawing his philosophy from. Uh, and everything that's wrong with it. But I would say when you analyze it metaphysically, morally, historically, economically, on phil- you know, in terms of philosophical anthropology, it gets everything fundamentally wrong. Um, when you look at what it's done, that alone should be enough for you to want to reject it. Um, and then the key is to, is to try and see when the ideology is is creeping up and how it's creeping up again because it never like people think like we won the cold war and that was it now it's this has been festering in academia for a long long time wow. and it's it's now really um taking hold of our population in a i think a pretty frightening way um so the we'll language see. wars i mean the manipulation of language the revision of history uh, all of it, right? The, yeah. the tribalistic, intersectionality, class-based, racial, um, uh, you know, manufactured warfare, all of it. Yeah, all of that. Mm-hmm. It's so crazy. I think one connecting piece, for me at least, after this discussion, and you don't need to ask me another question. I think that was good for today. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll prepare I, more in advance. No, no, time, this yeah. was awesome. I think a connecting piece for me is just the... So, for example, with this uh, issue of socialism, church condemns it right when it creeps up in the mid-1800s, right? Uh, In the late 1800s, especially like Pope Leo XIII, um, condemns socialism. And then, but that was before we really saw the ravenous effects and that had, had been tested, but we already knew that it didn't make sense, that it actually was opposing God's will. And if people had just listened to the church... It would have just prevented millions and millions of people of dying in the 20th century. And, but people don't listen to the church. Okay, fast forward in time. People predicted, I remember this, I think you'll, you may remember this too. Before 2015, when there was still a debate about gay marriage, conservatives and Catholics and um, all these people came out and said, hey, if you let this happen, here's what's going to happen. Basically, like once you let the Pandora's box out, you just redefine marriage to the point where marriage loses its meaning and anything is fair game. And every opponent was like, no, that's ridiculous. This is just what we want. Slippery just, slope fallacy. No, all yeah, this, no slippery right, slope yeah. here. And, but what happened? Boom. Like right when that was legalized, we see now the transgender movement take off like immediately after that. And we see just this gradual devolving as a society that has expedited exponentially um it's just like quickened the pace of our moral depravity as a nation uh since 2015 and that's only five years we're talking about like that's crazy but had people actually listened to the church listen to the voices that were saying listen we see the philosophy and the theology and the the all the presuppositions behind what's happening and this is where it ends and people ignored it Right. You know, maybe it's time for people to listen to the it's, church. It's funny. I have a, a, a recent conversation with somebody, a friend of mine, who's, who's agnostic, and he's very libertarian leading. Um, I would say he's probably mostly liberal in his commitments, but he admitted this to me. He said, you know, when all the, the sexual stuff was originally, you know, really being debated, uh, I always thought conservatives were just conspiracy theorists. And, you know, they, they would say it would lead to all this insane stuff and, and even, even promotions of pedophilia. And he's like, 
now I'm on their side, right? Because he's, he's seen it. He's seen it. And he's like, and he's like, I wish that I wouldn't have fought against them because, uh, so this is some guy, eh? he's not religious. He's not, he's never been a conservative. Um, and has had his mind actively changed because he's, he's seen exactly what you've described. Right. Mm-hmm. And there's always hope for things to reverse, for things to change, but it takes conversion of heart. It takes prayer, penance. It takes like <laughs> us, you know, changing into saints, uh, ultimately and, and, and having an influence on society. And I think the hope really, the more I think about things, it's, you know, the domestic church, the family, building up the family, um, you know, that doesn't mean, and every generation, we all have to face persecution. Like if you seek to live a godly life, you will face persecution. So that seems to be inevitable. Like to be Christian, you will be persecuted. I think we just have to band together during this, whatever's coming next and say, Hey, we're going to live in the truth, whatever it takes. And we're going to try to push that Overton window or whatever you called it in the right direction, slowly but surely. It may take be a bold. Long time. Yes, be yes. bold. And like that's the thing is like, you know, obviously I think people on the on the left, progressive left, are very zany and they believe in sane and often immoral things, but I gotta give it to them. Like they're at least they're at least bold. bold right. Yeah. And as Christians, that's what we're we're called to be bold, right? So yeah. there is something to be learned there is that um if you're if you're willing to be bold and you're willing to get out there, you can you can move the conversation. You can, and we need to do that. Mm-hmm. I remind remind of the verse in Second Timothy: uh, For God has not given you a spirit of fear or timidity. Uh, for God has not given you a spirit of timidity to fall back into fear, but has given you a spirit of power and of love and of self control. And so, I think that's a great way to end. Like, let's just reflect on that. And, you know, by virtue of our confirmation as Catholics, we've been given the gift of fortitude. And so we have every reason to be bold. You know, you shouldn't be afraid of suffering because you can offer that up in union with Christ for the salvation of the world. You shouldn't be afraid of death because we have the hope of the resurrection. And if you don't fear suffering or death, you have nothing to fear. And perfect love casts out fear anyway. So there's no reason not to be bold. And and step up to the plate and like fight and and please everyone keep me accountable to being bold as well like uh, because there are a lot of pressures and nobody likes to be seen as a bigot or uh, you know someone like that but at the end of the day like to live a godly life you will be persecuted and you just got to count the cost and, and it, still follow yeah, Jesus and one you know one thing about the bigot thing is that uh, the reason. The fundamental reason that I take the positions I do is because I think that that's what it means to live a good life. And I want everybody to flourish, right? And to love somebody is to will the good of the other. So in any sense, you know, if I have a family member as I have who's struggling with, you know, drug or alcohol addiction, um, and I say, I don't think you should be doing that. Uh, I really don't think it like, it's not, it's not bigoted, right? That's right. It's like, I think that's really bad for you. And it's, it's because it's I care. Loving. It's because I care about you that I want you to stop that. Um, so, you know, like maybe you think that we're wrong. Um, I certainly don't think we are. But you don't, yeah, and anybody who's willing to promote this, don't don't worry about being called names. You'll, you'll be called names no matter what. Just, just uh, you know, present it in, in, you know, with as much clarity and generosity as possible. And then... Uh, and then pray, you know, and then pray. <laughs> like God do yes. the rest, right? That's 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 all we can do. Mm-hmm. Pray, hope, and don't worry, as Padre Pio said. All right, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Have a great, great day. Beloved, I'm Annabelle Mosley, author, professor of theology, and host of Then Sings My Soul and Destination Sainthood on WCAT Radio. I invite you to listen in 
and find inspiration along this sacred journey we're traveling together to make our lives a masterpiece and, with God's grace, become saints. Join me, Annabelle Mosley, for Then Sings My Soul and Destination Sainthood on WCAT Radio. God bless you. Remember, you're never alone. God is always with you. Thank you for listening to a production of WCAT Radio. Please join us in our mission of evangelization. And don't forget, love lifts up when knowledge takes flight.